this is again uh, my old uh, comrade in arms, uh, Hussain Yamir Ahmadi. I think that um, uh, we were at the beginning of the formation of AIC, you know, things changed differently. Um, my husband always tells me that I have the misfortune of being a Cassandra. Uh, the curse of Cassandra was that uh, she told the truth and because she was Persean, but the curse was that nobody believed her. But that is, in general, the curse of people uh, who do not follow the conventional wisdom or they are not part of the pack. And this has been my misfortune of not being part of the pack. I could have done that. The other thing is that I always tell the truth, irrespective of whom it pleases. So if I disagree with the interpretation of the character of Islamic Republic, which I think is similar to the Holy Roman Empire that was neither holy nor neither empire, which is neither Islamic nor Republic, that, that so be it. But um, so I'm going to tell you a few home truths uh, the way I see it, according to my very limited lights. Uh, mercifully, uh, I am also an adept of Rumi, but more importantly of Hafez who is the really true spirit of Iran. And that is that you have to have a certain humility in general. And if you don't, and you see yourself as knowing all, then obviously there's going to be pitfalls. So uh, I stand to be corrected on everything that uh, you good folks, that many of you know a lot better on certain aspects of the issue than I do. Please uh, don't hesitate to challenge me and, and call me that. Um, first of all, I would like to, um, I start by saying that uh, the Western, in general, obsession with Iran is a very long-standing. I will tell you a story which maybe um, I would cut into my time, but I think that some of these stories are. I was invited uh, some time ago uh, by something, the Onassis Foundation of Greece, who had created something called the Athens Dialogue. What can the ancient Greece teach us to cope with the current issues. Uh, given the fact that I work at Center for Muslim Christian Understanding and so on, uh, I try to say that actually uh, the interpretations of uh, Greece's interaction with the East as being uh, always con uh, confrontational and that of being barbarian, barbarians, meaning the Persians, because they had you know, beards even then, uh, and the civilized, meaning the Athenians, uh, uh, this was a little bit not actually the case, and that there were a lot more positive interactions, and that, in fact, uh, the uh, Greeks themselves, whether it was Xenophon or, 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 or some others and so on, uh, had much more nuanced visions of the uh, uh, Persians and Iran than did the uh, uh, neoclassical uh, Enlightenment figures who tended to idealize Greece without any uh, thing. Uh, so the, but then I, I wrote something like that and I was very complimentary about Greece and the Greek culture, how wonderful they were, they were much better than the Persians and how much they contributed and so on and so forth. And I was hoping that at least I would get a, a little bit of thanks. But uh, not just that did not happen. There were two speakers, one of them was actually French, a French academician, who said that my words actually <coughs> uh, reminded him that the, the, uh, the sound of Xerxes's army is approaching. So he said, no, really, this was his exact word. Uh, uh, sounds of the Xerxes's army is approaching. And the editor of the Spiegel said that, how dare you to compare the Persians and the Greeks? So I think that we really do need to understand Iran, which I think it really is an obsession of the West, um, uh, didn't start with the Islamic Republic. Uh, by the same token, because everybody now has, uh, you know, once everything goes, I remember somebody used to joke that after the uh, Islamic Revolution, somebody in CIA had put up a sign and saying that Musad the comeback, all is forgiven. Uh, because they had, but this is problem. We have idealized our relationship with the Shah. But if you really remember, there was no love actually among Americans for the Shah, which is quite, quite interesting. Um, a lot of people say, well, you know, the so and so never did everything we wanted. Uh, but, and, and, and the Shah did a lot. I mean, the idea that you know, Saddam Hussein by arming to the teeth uh, with the uh, 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 Russian uh, uh, weapons, which then he turned it on Iran, 
uh, but there was no congressional thing on uh, preventing arms sales to Iran, uh, uh, to Iraq, but everything was. So I think that this has very deep to do, and I think part of it has to do with the British, and so on. I don't want to get into that because it will. So one thing we have to understand, some of the problems with Iran really uh, uh, transcends this uh, regime character. I believe the West will always going to have problem with Iran, whether it is Islamic, uh, nationalist, uh, or it's socialist, or whatever other kind. I think any Iran that the West can live with, actually an Iran that is probably confined to Tehran, Isfahan, and Karaj, you know, a, a sort of a, a Afghanistan redux. Okay, so this is just, I think that when you're talking about Iran and all that, keep this in mind. Uh, because uh, even the Islamists, right now, one of the biggest things is going on in Iraq is not whether Ahmadinejad won uh, two thirds or four thirds and so on, is really what is the real foundation of Iran's identity. Uh, the, the reason they are after Ahmadinejad and Rahim Mashahi is that he made the big mistake of talking actually that we have to talk about Iran. Islam Irani, not Iran Islami. Iranian Islam and not the Islamic Iran, which the Ayatollah Tim Sahi, oh, excuse me, Ms. Bahi Azdi, then came and said that, what is Iran? Iran is a piece of land. It is Islam that's important. My answer to all this Ayatollah is that if Iran is merely a vessel and its substance is important, please take all your establishment from home and leave. Leave, just leave, you know? So this is what is going on in Iran. It is much more deeper than Khamenei, this and that. It's about identity and it's about power because identity and power are related. Identity and security are related. So I think that we need to deepen our analysis of Iran beyond the kind of the CNN and, and, and <laughs> NPR, frankly, or even McNeil letter, which is no longer McNeil. Uh, well, so this is one thing. Let me just uh, say a number of axioms uh, that is about Iran, and then ask you why it is, and then, you know, of course I have to be careful. I can't say all the truth, then I would just lose my job too. So I have to be careful. <laughs> one of the axioms is that Iran is inherently expansionist. Whether it is the Shah who wants to be gendarme, or it is the Ayatollahs who want to create the Shia Crescent. Whoever invented this word Shia Crescent did well for himself, but not good for Iran or for Islam. And I'm sorry to say that this happens. Iran is uh, uh, the, uh, uh, a terrorist support. This is another axiom that nobody even questions. This is, Iran is the main barrier to arab israeli peace. This is another one. Iran is a global threat. Or if you listen to uh, Netanyahu, he's a threat to humanity. Now how could that be a threat to humanity? That I find it really very difficult because even a nuclear armed Iran cannot destroy the entire humanity. So why are this, uh, um, I will just sort of question that the veracity of these things later. But why are, these axioms, these beliefs have been developed. One of it, actually, I have to put the blame wherever it is, is the Iranians' fault. Iran's political culture is one of what I call uh, self-aggrandissement, which it's a very narcissistic culture. Narcissism is a mixture of low self-respect and exaggerating your worth. It's a mixture of victimhood and a mixture of wanting to be the big. So whether it is the Shah who wants to create Indian Ocean thing, or it is Ayatollah Khamenei who thinks that the world revolves uh, around oil. The fact is, neither the Shah could be the qibla ye alam, nor that the world revolves uh, around the bomb or anywhere else. Some of it has to do with Iranians. Look the way the Saudis have behaved by contrast. Saudi rhetoric has always been how weak we are, how vulnerable we are. Uh, please, American friends, come and help us, and so on. And then they have done all they can to actually damage Americans. Look at uh, Al Qaeda. Look at Pakistan. Pakistan, all the stuff that has happened. Look at Yemen. 
In fact, it's an interesting comparison to do that. Uh, to get into these things, uh, look, for instance, uh, they say that um, uh, Iran is inherently expansionist. Well, we have to have some you know, basis, some standards to judge this expansionism. When you look at Iran's history, Iran actually has lost territories. Herat, for instance, which the Haratis didn't want. They fought with Iranians. They wanted to stay with Iran. So the British got that, of course. But Iran gave up Bahrain. I will submit to you, if Iran had a proper parliament uh, in 19, whatever it was, 60, 72, whatever, there would be no Iranian who would vote for giving up Bahrain. Then what the uh, Saudis did, they built the causeway and essentially made Bahrain an annex, which was showed that they didn't have insight because Bahrain is an eastern province, people close to one another. So if you are frightened of the Shias, you don't want more Shias, you know, you want something less. Again, you know, Iran is a terrorist supporter. They get Iran here is responsible. Hezbollah is a different issue. Iran does help Hezbollah and so on. And so on. Hamas is not quite clear uh, because it doesn't really uh, make uh, good politics to say that most of Hamas money actually comes from Arab sources. When Khalid Mashal was elected uh, to the <laughs> Uh, parliament, you know, when they had the 2006 election, he didn't go to Tehran first. He went to Riyadh. You have to understand that, which will, this will bring me whether the changes in Egypt actually will increase Iran's influence. The fact is, it will decrease Iran's influence. Hamas is not, if you have Egypt, who needs Iran? Egypt, Iran is not in a position to help Hamas. Egypt is there, had ruled Gaza for, for years and years and years. Uh, so this is, you know, uh, some of those uh, I think that, but there are other reasons also uh, why this whole Iranian thing is exaggerated. I will submit we did have an enemy vacuum. Everybody had an enemy vacuum after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the Iranians, through their rhetoric, through their basic characters of boasting and, and you know, uh, being like that, uh, and, in fact, Musaddegh was like that too, not we think that he was a saint. He was a very inept politician. Uh, they have played uh, you know, uh, uh, into this thing, but there was an enemy back you. You had to, you had to, I mean, even today, we want to have a missile shield against whom? We cannot say we want it against the Russians. No, Iran, Iran is posing a desert. They want to buy arms to protect against whom? Of course, against Iran. And uh, if you look at it, but there's no way we are looking at it. Look at the Iranian Air Force. Still, they have those uh, rag tag, you know, Air Force that had remained from Shasta. How they are going to withstand that any kind of air thing? Iranian airways are defenseless. This is one thing. Look at the Navy. Of course, you know, for the, the Defense Minister Bahidi goes and says, we have built this and we have built that. Those will be knocked out, believe me, in a 15-minute confrontation, not just with the American Navy, but any kind of a, even European Navy, any decent middle-sized Navy will make uh, mincemeat out of the Arabian Navy uh, in one little uh, single. Yes, I will. When I am the last one, of course, it always happens. Who says that women have won equality? <laughs> <coughs> okay, let me just say a few things. First of all, I think actually the uh, Arab uprising has a basic defeat for Iran. In fact, the, the Egyptian uh, delegation that went to Tehran one of the things that I, I was int intrigued that this was in all the Persian websites, uh, which was quite interesting, including in uh, Larijani's websites, that Larijani is running a, a campaign with, uh, I mean, he will do anything to get rid of Ahmadinejad, even if it brings the country down with him. Uh, yes, that's, that's the problem. So they had said openly to them that these this revolutions were not Islamic in the sense of this. And Iran is, is scrambled to say that all this is from Imam al-Rahel, Imam al-Rahel, and this, and this, and this. But the fact is, it is not. One of the problems of Iran is that the Iranian revolution was not exportable. 
I wrote this in 1987, and it wasn't exported. And Nahda has nothing to do with Khomeini. Of course, if you pay their, for their trip and you take them to Tehran, they will say what they want in Tehran, then they go to Tunis and say something else. The same thing with Ikhwan al-Muslimin. Ikhwan al-Muslimin is very much influenced nowadays by Salafis thing. And whether you like it or not, there is a visceral hatred of Shia. I mean, they openly say that they are zammul halal. You know, you, you, can, uh, you can kill them, and that's OK. So how can Iran win from this situation? Secondly, if Iran had any influence in the Arab world, in part was because Egypt was out of the Arab equation. When Egypt comes back into the Arab equation and takes the mantle of Arab populism, Persian Iran is not going to have any, any place in this. And uh, it's all very nice to say we are all friends, but there are some primordial, unfortunately, feelings and so on that are there, and no amount of glossing over is going to be. The same thing people say that Turkey, Islamic Turkey now is going to be an ally of Iran, and they're going to create this uh, anti-US coalition of Egypt, Iran. This is another pipe dream that is going on in Tehran. I don't think that the thoughtful people, even within the regime, believe in any of these things. But all these things you know, has a way of the, is on autopilot. They just keep saying and writing, and without the, you know, but there are people who actually think otherwise. Quite the opposite. An Islamist Turkey is a far more threat to Iran than the generals were ever were. First, Ottomans. Secondly, Davudoglu. Because of, Turkey is making inroads in part of Iran. If you look at the pattern of Turkish business investment in Iran, it is only where that you have Turkic speaking people, in Hamadan, in Azerbaijan, in Urmia. They are creating things for the sort of pan-Islamic, pan turkish thing. Secondly, AKP's uh, ideology is a mixture of Islam and Turkish nationalism. Whereas in Iran, the uh, Islamic Republic is the enemy of Iran and the Iranian nationalism. As I say, they say Iran is the Zarf and Islam is the Mazruf, and the Zarf does have no value whatsoever. So my bottom line is, actually, notwithstanding that it might be useful again, whether we want to go to war and put some more sanctions or uh, do certain things to continue saying that Iran has won, uh, to continue on this thing. But actually, I think Iran is a clear loser. And I will say you one other thing. I said this, I remember Ted Koppel, when the Persian Gulf, the first Persian Gulf War was going on, he said that, of course, Iran, like a Cheshire cat, is sitting there and is going to swallow Iraq. And I said, you know, he is the guru we listen to. I said, how could this happen? If Saddam wins, of course, he is going to be victorious and will turn again against Iraq to liberate the Ahwazis. If Saddam loses, we'll have America as neighbor, and that's what we did. It was after the Persian Gulf War that we had the dual containment, and so on, and so on, and so on, uh, and on, and on, and on. So I think that um, I just don't know how one can get, get, sort of get over this kind of mindset about analysis of Iran. Uh, but basically, I think that uh, some of it has to do that, frankly, we don't have many people who actually know Iran historically as well. Iran is a big country with a long history, and many, many even Iranians don't know it. And studying Iran is a full-time occupation. I read about actually six, seven hours of various sources. <laughs> you know, and, and many of uh, don't have the time to do it, or you just can't read Washington Post and New York Times or a couple of uh, you know, websites or blogs and think that, uh, I mean, it does require a lot of elbow grease. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm sorry, you've been very generous. I shut up. Uh, but so my thinking, if we want to get Iran-US relations going, first we really have to upgrade the indigenous American expertise on Iran. Secondly, be aware of this whole background of this sort of obsession with Iran, fascination, repulsion, obsession. 